Hi, FF Conf. Yeah. Uh, my name is James Kyle. I'm an open source developer and educator. Um, I've had the opportunity to work on a lot of cool projects. And a uh, fun fact, I'm the model behind Apple's new bearded emoji. Uh, before I dive into it, I wanted to start off by thanking the conference organizers, uh, Julie, Remy, and everyone else who put this together, all the volunteers. Putting on a conference is not easy. And uh, so far, you've done a wonderful job. So give them a round of applause. Uh, Remy and I uh, met each other a little while ago. Uh, we first met because we were speaking on a panel together at EdgeConf in London. And uh, I brought a photo with me uh, of that. Uh, you can see Remy on the left uh, looking very angry at Lee Byron. Uh, and then there's just me. And I'm pretty sure I'm just staring at Remy's t-shirt. Let's get a closer look at that shirt. Um, <laughs> that's Mr. T sitting as Santa with uh, Nancy Reagan sitting on his lap. Um, Remy was really proud of that shirt. Uh, I really like that. Uh, earlier this year, uh, Remy reached out to me uh, after one of my many, many Twitter rants um, and asked me to give this talk. I agreed pretty quickly at the time because I was really excited about the topic uh, and I thought it would be a cool talk to give. Um, I want to talk to you today about some of the ideas I have in my head about how we can improve the web as this like developer platform. Uh, there's a lot of different perspectives on this, so I'm going to take it a little bit slow. Before I dive into how this talk really came to be, I wanted to share the backstory of how I learned how to build stuff for the web. My first job doing any kind of web-related work was a marketing internship I had when I was 16. Uh, my job was to prepare and send out email newsletters to customers. It was easy enough, but I got bored. Uh, the emails were pretty much just plain text, and I thought I could make them look cooler. Uh, so I decided to learn how to make them myself. Uh, HTML seemed pretty straightforward, but if you've ever built an email template, uh, you'll know it's complete trash. Uh, it's improved a lot today with newer tools and improved email clients, but back then it was a nightmare. You didn't get to use CSS because none of the email clients supported that. Uh, you were limited to HTML attributes for styling, and you had to use tables for any kind of layout and all sorts of crazy hacks. Um, there were all sorts of inconsistencies between email clients. They would actually mess with your HTML and try to be smart, uh, but instead they're just incredibly frustrating. Spent months trying to make these emails consistent across every single email client, and the end result wasn't even satisfying because I had to trim it down so much that it would look normal. But then I had the opportunity to build an actual website, and I was so excited. I got to use this all cool new stuff that didn't work inside emails like CSS and JavaScript. So I popped open W3Schools and got to work. Everything was immediately better. CSS alone made it so much easier to make things look right, and I was so proud of myself. Everything looks so cool and so flashy now that I didn't have to worry about the email clients anymore. Now I got to worry about the differences between browsers. But it sucked that all the stuff that I learned to make that email template was suddenly useless to me. I didn't need to use tables for layout. I didn't need to use any of the hacks that I had learned. Sure, there were problems in browsers, but they were totally new problems. And I kept building websites for a while. And as I said in my bio, I made a couple hundred bucks over the summer setting up WordPress for my mom's friends. After a while, I wanted to get a full-time job. And so I moved to Boston, and I found myself working on a Ruby on Rails app uh, for a startup. Certainly, everything I knew was wrong again. I had to relearn everything. HTML was suddenly ERB, CSS was SAS, JavaScript was CoffeeScript, and just as I was com getting comfortable with Prototype.js, everyone was switching to jQuery. At that point, I felt like every couple of months I was throwing out everything I had learned and learning something new. You fast forward another six months, and I need to build my first client-side app. I needed more JavaScript than I'd ever written before, and I was told that I needed to use a framework. But when I went to pick one out, suddenly I had all these options presented to me. There was no React or Vue at the time, but there was Backbone, Angular, Ember, Knockout, Dojo, XGS, and so many more. Uh, I was overwhelmed, and I had no idea how to select one of them. I ended up making a table that compared things like GitHub stars and Stack Overflow questions. Uh, and at the time, Angular was blowing up, so it won all of those metrics easily. Uh, and so that's what I went with. But I wasn't really prepared from how different from everything else I had done was. It took months to understand the differences between services and factories and what the hell scope was, how the hell anything actually worked. I managed to build the app, but I really just didn't know how it worked. I was miserable and beginning to think that programming wasn't for me. But I stuck with it, and the next few years were filled with me jumping between frameworks, um, like Backbone and Ember and all sorts of other things. I even became a core team member of one of them, Marionette. Um, which got me into open source. 
In the last few years, I've moved away from front-end development, and I started doing developer tooling in Node.js. Um, if you ever use Babel or Flow or Yarn or Lerna, um, they're all projects that I've been involved with. Um, working outside of the front end, I've learned more than I ever had before, and so much faster than I like, ever thought I could. Uh, it's so much better <laughs> that I don't think I'd go back. Uh, but more importantly, the things I learned a few years ago in Node are still true today, and the code I wrote back then looks just like the code I wrote today. I just have arrow functions and classes now. But back when I was just starting to get into Node, I wasn't learning in this weird incremental way. Everything was thrown at me at once, and anything I wanted to do was just to require a statement away. And sure, it was a bit intimidating, but not any more than anything else I had learned. So what was different for front end? Fast forward to this year when I was asked to give this talk. It was, one after, it was after one of my many <laughs> Twitter rants. It started off like this. Do not divide the web into documents and applications. Documents are dead. At the time, I had a friend who was just starting to get into web development because she wanted to build an app. It seemed like a cool idea, and she was really motivated, so I wanted to help her out. She shared all these resources that she was using to learn about web development, things you might expect, tutorials, interactive guides, and such. I went through them myself just to like, see what she was actually learning. And at first, it was this trip down memory lane, things I struggled with myself when I was starting, stuff that is like second nature to me now, but once made me so frustrated. But after I went through a couple of links she sent me, I realized something. If her goal was to build an app, why was she being told to focus on so much on these things? They weren't the basics of app development. So why did she need to start so far back? It was where I started. I learned in this really roundabout way, years of frustration and years of throwing out knowledge and starting over any time I need to do something slightly more complex. Why couldn't she just start off by building an app on day one? And so I had an idea. Together, we got started with Node and Create React App. Uh, in a few minutes, we created her first app. And it was a really positive experience. But when I started to share that idea with others, they didn't share my excitement. It turns out suggesting someone should start web development by creating a React app is a bit controversial. And there's more than one reason why, but I think a lot of it comes down to a certain attitude about education that I disagree with. When it comes to learning about any topic, a lot of people want there to be this very clearly defined order what you're supposed to learn in. And the web development community is no exception. They think of it a lot like building a house. You lay the foundation, you put up the framing, you insert the plumbing and do the wiring, and eventually you've built a house. But that's not how learning works at all, and that's not even how house building works. If you started building a house by laying the foundation, you'd get a number of things wrong, and then you'd have to start over. You can't build a house until you've fully conceptualized it. You need to know, you lay the foundation, you need to know what the entire house is going to look like. You need a blueprint. I believe that learning complex topics like web development should be done in these passes. You should understand where all the pieces fit before you dive into any one of them. I think it would be impossible for someone to fully learn CSS without learning about HTML and JavaScript and accessibility and design and all these other things that are intertwined with one another that really make CSS what it is. You don't need to learn any of them to completion, but you need to become comfortable with them. And it's our jobs as educators to make people comfortable with these topics. If my goal is to teach my friend how to build apps, I should get her building her first app as fast as possible so that she can see all the pieces, so that she can explore this blueprint of the house that she wants to build. It might seem wrong, but I would teach her how to run Create React app before I'd even touch on HTML or CSS. Why does she need to know those things to have something displayed on a page? And what better way to teach her those things than to see how they affect the final product? I know that this is controversial among educators, but I would really like to change people's minds. I build apps and tools for a living, but I don't think that anything I'm doing is particularly difficult. I'm not saying that because I don't recognize how far I've come or because I don't recognize the privileges that I had when I was learning. I'm saying it because I don't think it requires some sort of super intelligence to do what I do, despite what my mom says to her friends. Believe that I believe that complex topics like web app development can be broken down in a way that gives someone a working knowledge really, really quickly. Let me give you an example. Two years ago, I started writing this handbook on compilers, a topic that most would consider extremely complex and overwhelming to learn. And I wanted, 
And I had been learning about compilers over the last year uh, because of my work on Babel. I was blown away by how straightforward it actually was. I wanted to write down what I had learned, both so that I could teach others and so that I could cement my own knowledge. I rewrote the guide in several different ways. At first, I started writing it like a traditional book on compilers. When I stepped back and explained a great deal about how compilers perform operations, explaining binary machine code, then explaining what an assembler is and how it creates an assembly code, uh, then how source code differs from assembly and how it, why we can't just use an assembler, then diving into parsing and all the different phases of parsing and how, oh my god, I'm making myself dizzy and more importantly, I'm making myself bored. <laughs> but then I decided, no. I'm gonna cover all this shit as quickly as I can. I'm gonna implement an actual compiler as a way to teach people. And a few hours later, the super tiny compiler was born. The compiler itself was only about 200 lines of code. It actually started about 400, but I kept trimming away at it until all the important pieces were there and nothing else. From there, I added about 800 lines of code comments, which explain every single line of code and why it's there. It's all in one file, and you can read it about 15 minutes from end to end. About seven months later, I finally published a handbook, and the reaction blew me away. I had people who studied computer science at university message me. People who had to implement a compiler in their classes tell me that their guide, this guide finally made compilers click for them. On the other side, there are people who were just learning JavaScript and who had no computer science education who read it and went out and wrote their own Babel plugins in a matter of weeks. And then there was this final group of people who hated my handbook. They said that it taught compilers wrong that I skipped over way too much stuff or that I explained something incorrectly. They told me that I was actively doing harm by writing this handbook. And they might sound like inflammatory people, but a lot of people actually think that way. So let me explain why I disagree with it. I believe in order to truly dive deep into a topic, you need to first know how it relates to everything else. Otherwise, you're learning in isolation, and maybe that works for some people for some time, but you won't fully understand any topic that way. And I don't think that covering a topic quickly and giving imprecise definitions does harm to future learning. Maybe if you're outright lying to them, but not if you're just optimizing for comprehension. So that's why I don't think this line of thinking is good. I don't think that my friend needs to learn everything about HTML and CSS before she can start building an app. I don't think that skipping over them and giving a quick summary hurts her ability to learn about them later on either. In fact, I think that this is the best way that she could learn about building an app. Now that she has everything in the right place and a blueprint to guide her, she can dive down to each topic and learn about it inside context. So if we're not starting with HTML and CSS, what do we start with? Well, for my friend, I started with Create React App, and we dove straight into components. Within minutes, she was creating her own components and writing them onto a page. It was one of those teaching moments that felt really great. She was so excited about creating an app, but when she saw this massive list of things that she was supposed to learn first, she was intimidated and felt discouraged. Building an app felt so far away that she was risking giving up. But when she created that second component, she was immediately excited again. I want to explain why I think that second component was so important, because that's what led to this tweet. The early days of the web look a lot different than they do today. Our idea of what the web uh, could be has changed a whole bunch. The web was a, designed as a way to share documents, and it did it so well. And I'm not going to say that we haven't done a good job building and extending on that platform, because we really have. We're catching up to these native platforms faster than anyone would have expected. But if we look at the things that people are building for the web today, it's a lot different than what we started out with. You don't have to look far to see these incredible apps that we once thought had to be written natively, which are now being built for the web. Our friggin' IDEs are being built in JavaScript these days. People are building VR games with them. And it's not just them. Even supposedly simple websites have a lot going on. I think the most documented, oriented websites we have today are news websites and blogs. Ignoring the advertising and social media crap on every news website, they still have a lot of things going on. They've got image galleries and videos and interactive charts and comment sections and lots more. Even personal blogs are getting super complex. There's even supposedly like these minimalistic websites like Medium. It has cut, uh, highlights and kudos and claps or whatever they're calling it these days. Inline comments followed by a full comment section which includes their own text editors. You've got notifications and embeddable content. And even though the focus is still on text, it's barely a document. 
The truth is that the web we're building today is a lot more than documents. It's about apps. But what the hell does app even mean? What makes an app an app? Is it that we have a lot of JavaScript? Or that we're doing client-side routing or rendering? No, I think the difference between a document and an app is components. A document is a static page where all the elements are written in order exactly the way they are meant to appear. But in an app, you rip out all the reusable bits and create components out of them which you can render however many times you want. And don't think too deeply about the word component. I mean it very loosely. I'm not talking about React or Vue components. I'm not even talking about web components. It's a lot simpler than that. I think a component could be as simple as a string template. Anything that makes your elements reusable. And by this definition, we haven't been building documents for a really long time. Server-side frameworks have been building with components since the early days of the web. They might not have been called that, but it's what they were. My first website used iframe so that I could reuse the same HTML for navigation on every page. And some might call that stupid. But I needed, my, I needed a component, and it seemed like a good way at the time. And then WordPress gave me templates, and then Rails gave me views, and then Angular gave me directives, and finally React gave me components. Fundamentally, they were all trying to do the same thing. We just made it possible to do more and more things with them. And the truth is, it's impossible to build just about anything for the web without some kind of pattern for reusing code. Components are a necessary part of the web. And you can't build apps with the primitives given to you by a document way of thinking. In order to build an app, you have to tack something onto the web, whether it be WordPress templates or React components. But what about the flip side? Let's imagine building a document on a web built for apps. Well, what is a document but one single giant static component? If the first step to creating something on the web would be writing a component, then all you have to do to create a document is fill out that component. The truth is, documents can exist in a web designed for apps, but apps cannot exist within a web designed for documents, not without adding something else on. So back to my friend. When she started Create, App, Create React App with only one component, it wasn't much more than a document. It wasn't that exciting. But when she created her second component and inserted it into the first, that's when she got really excited and started asking all these questions about how you could use components to build things. From her first component to her second, she didn't need to learn much of anything. She was just moving some code around. But when I had to make that switch, Suddenly I had to learn a server-side framework with its own templating engine. What I learned about documents really didn't matter now that I went to apps and it was very frustrating. And that's why I believe that we should teaching the web in terms of components. Web Development 101 should be starting off with, hello, here's our hello world components. And now let's create a generic greeting component so we can say hi to whoever we want. We need to rethink the starting experience for new web developers so that components are an earlier step and we need to structure web education around components. But that's not enough. We really need to recenter the web around this idea of components. My biggest complaint with web components today is that they never really took it far enough. I don't want to write doc type HTML. I only ever want to work with components. I want to be able to create a new file, write a component, open up in a web browser, and see the content. This next part is going to focus a lot more on the JavaScript side of things, and not because I think it only applies to JavaScript, but because the problems that we're facing in JavaScript are, much, are in a much more problematic state today. When I, first made, when I made my first website, I didn't use any tools. It was just me, the code, and the browser. When I made a change, I got to see exactly what it did with zero interference. And I'll be honest with you, this was a really great way to learn. We should always try to keep that aspect of the web around. But just because I didn't use any tools doesn't, doesn't mean that they wouldn't have been useful. In fact, a big reason I didn't use any tools is because most of the tools that we have today didn't even exist at the time. But the biggest reason is that I wasn't told about them. I just sort of stumbled upon them because I needed them. First, I used a tool for file concatenation, so I didn't have to manually specify every script tag. And then I used a minifier to make that file smaller. And then I used require.js because the file concatenator kept breaking. And then Node.js came along with NPM, a real package manager for JavaScript with thousands of packages. But most of those packages only work inside of Node, so I started using Bower. 
Then Browserfy came along, and suddenly almost anything that worked inside of Node also worked in the browser. And then my app started to get really big, and so I needed to use code splitting. Luckily, Webpack came along, and it was really good at code splitting. But apps still keep growing and growing, and now we're trying to find these new innovative ways to make them smaller and keep them that way. I could do this for every set of the tools in my stack. Over time, we've created more and more of these tools, replacing old ones with new, require JS to browserify to Webpack, finding better ways to solve the same problems. But the point is, is that we can walk through each tool in the ecosystem and find plenty of reasons for it. The evolution of tools might have been hectic, but it was always well motivated. These tools aren't going to go away either. We're not going to stop having a Babel or a Webpack at some point in the future. Tools get replaced, and every now and then one of them dies. But we're always going to have these tools. We aren't going to get rid of them. They're here to stay. So back to my friend again. Create React app gave her a pretty ideal setup. She got Webpack, Babel, ESLint, and all these other tools, all packaged together with a fantastic developer experience. Everything was carefully designed right out of the box, and when something goes wrong, it tells you exactly what it was. It also managed to keep that fast feedback loop that I had when I was starting. As soon as you edit code, the paid automatically refreshes to show you what the difference was. But it even goes further. If you accidentally cause an error or break an important lint rule, it will pop up a message right in your browser telling you exactly what you did wrong. And I think this is such a great tool for beginners who don't yet know how to debug with dev tools. There are lots of tool chains like Create React App. We have a dozen or so within the React community alone. And Remy gave a workshop about this tool called Next.js, which fills the same space. But why are these tools that rep other tools necessary? Anyone who has ever tried to set up all these tools from scratch themselves will know that it's not an easy task. Every new thing that you add needs to work with all the other things. Webpack needs to work with Babel, which needs to work with Jest, which needs to work with ESLint, and all these tools touch each other at some point and if you don't have them working together, it will cause you pain. You end up having to fill out tons and tons of configuration, informing each tool of the environment around it. I say this as someone who has written a lot of tools that require configuration. It really sucks to have to do this, but the authors of these tools are just, are just as frustrated by it. Everyone wants to create a tool that works out of the box for everyone, but that's impossible considering where we're at in the ecosystem. Even highly opinionated tools end up with some amount of configuration, or people end up creating 30 forks of it. But for the tools that need to work for everyone like Babel or Webpack, we're forced to make them endlessly configurable and extensible so that everyone can use them. You see, the problem is that no two setups are the same. Everyone needs or wants to do something different with their tool chain. Authors of tools cannot make any assumptions about people's existing setups. At the same time, it's really hard to coordinate standards across these tools. We don't have any central body for it. And even when we make agreements, someone comes along and does something different. We need more coordination between the JavaScript tool, team. We need that tool chain. We need people to care about standardization, and we need people to make compromises. Otherwise, this problem is never going to get better. But that's not even the worst part of these tools. Let's take a look at a tool like Webpack. How many people here use Webpack? Yeah. I don't know many people that aren't using it these days. Webpack does a lot of neat things. It's extremely powerful and extremely flexible. But many of the features of Webpack are specific to Webpack. Things like loaders and require.context have no meaning in the JavaScript language or anywhere in the web platform. They don't even have an equivalent. So when you use any of these features, suddenly you aren't writing JavaScript anymore you're writing something Webpack specific. And even further, Webpack will be forced to implement some things incorrectly according to the JavaScript specification. It doesn't implement the JavaScript module system correctly at all. It can't because it would bloat everyone's code and slow everyone's apps down. Even just using Webpack means that your code is not quite compatible with the rest of the JavaScript ecosystem. You probably won't notice it often enough because uh, it'll be hidden behind package boundaries. But these differences do matter. Tools are always going to exist, and we need to be supporting them within our web standards. 
Otherwise, they'll be forced to diverge and create incompatibilities within our ecosystem. They might seem like small differences, but these differences matter when you consider the interoperability of the entire ecosystem. None of this is gonna go away until our standards start doing something about it. It's only going to get worse. I want to see the web community rally behind our tools. I've seen first impact, firsthand the impact that our tools can have when teaching. Just like with web components, I think that we could start people off with a set of tools designed to help them learn and guide them to being a web developer. I would also like for the tools to have a bigger seat at the table when it comes to standards. Let's give tools the resources they need to be more effective, to work together, and to follow standards. In fact, why don't we consider getting implementers behind and involved in some of our tools? The V8 team has been working with Babel lately, and as a result, Babel 7 is twice as fast as Babel 6. Why can't we design standards for tools to implement? Spec out Webpack and Babel so that we can innovate and compete with new implementations while maintaining standards that keep us all compatible. We should be investing more because our tools are not going away, but becoming bigger and bigger part of the web, and they should continue to do so. I think it's important to note that the web is still a privilege that a huge percentage of the world's population still does not have. We should be designing for the web for the next billion people, not for the web for the people that are already here. I think that this is something that we actually all agree on. We sometimes lose sight of it, but I've never seen someone truly disagree with that. And I really deeply care about this. Everything I've said today is a result of that. I'm not looking, care, I'm not looking out for myself or for my friends. I believe that this is a better future for the web. And I've touched on each of these, but I wanna go over each of the ways that I think we can improve the web. I have been teaching programming topics for a few years now, both in a conference setting like this and at an individual level at work or at meetups. Of course, in that time, I've developed my own opinion opinions about how best to teach. The most important thing that education has is to start with empathy. You cannot teach someone effectively without empathizing with them. Otherwise, you just come off like a jerk, expecting them to know things that they couldn't possibly know. Getting started with the web is really not that easy. There are a lot of things that you need to know at once, lots of things that you need to piece together, and maybe you don't think so, but consider those out there that have never done any sort of programming, some who don't speak English, and many who have had little to no access to a computer in their lives. Streamlining the getting started experience is important for them. By making the web centered around components, we can create a universal language for the web and how we describe templates or views or helpers or directives. By introducing tools from the start and designing them to work extremely well out of the box, we can make sure that new developers are staying on the right track. We can give them a more forgiving web. Another way that the web is still a privilege is through accessibility. While the web is much more accessible than the previous platforms that were out there, it still has a long way to go. It is our responsibility to those who need it to make the web accessible for them. We need to do a better job of teaching how to make the web more accessible, but we can do a step better than that. Through development tools, we can push developers to make their apps more accessible. We can teach them exactly how they need to do it. You can find dozens of Chrome extensions that help developer experience, <coughs> developers experience the web through the lens of someone else. But what happens when we get some of these more complicated components that don't have a clear answer how to make them accessible? Through package managers, we can share solutions better than ever before. You don't need to pull in all of jQuery UI or Bootstrap. You can just pull in the components that you need and even much more specific ones. Two years ago, at a previous job, I wrote a couple NPM packages for focusing state in apps, for managing focus state in apps. They were simple libraries, and they only took an hour or so to get them up on NPM. But a few months ago, one of my coworkers at my current job stumbled across these same packages and decided to use them. Two years apart, across jobs, I got to improve the accessibility of our apps using the same exact code. And that feels really good. I want more community efforts around making these accessible components and utilities so that we can all share. When we talk about performance, there's actually two kinds that we talk about. There's rendering performance and making sure that your app runs smoothly, but more importantly, we're talking about the startup time of your app and how much data that it uses. Our apps keep getting larger and larger, blah, larger, and it's totally unfair to people in some parts of the world where it can lead to some really expensive bills. We need to find new innovative ways to drive down the size of our apps. 
a lot of the time we talk about trimming a couple kilobytes here and there to make by using smaller libraries and such, but we need to be but we need to be making bigger wins than that. Otherwise, we'll just get caught up in the cycle of trimming and growing, always trending upwards. There are so many tricks we could use inside of our compilers to make our apps smaller and if we had a better target for compiling too. For example, why don't we make module bundling a first class citizen of the web? Allow multiple modules to be declared in a single file. Suddenly tools like Webpack would be trivial. Minifiers could be remove a lot more and the output would be much smaller. We know that we need to keep module bundlers around, so what's the problem with giving them a seat at the table? The last two categories are going to seem a bit different than the previous ones, but I've included them for a good reason. The web that we have is not as competitive as we like to think it is. The web is owned by just a few companies these days, like the Facebooks and Googles of the world. And we need to be making it more competitive. We need to have developers have these tools that they can use to, to, to drive down to, sorry. <laughs> we need to allow companies to innovate on the web. Uh, and we need to make developers and de designers more productive so that they can create uh, apps, they, so that they can have more time to make the performance of their apps better, so they can make their apps more accessible. The internet is not competitive enough. And I think that improving productivity and design does that. And I think that improving productivity and design will actually, sorry, <laughs> it'll uh, open up uh, education, accessibility, performance, and so on. I really hope that I've made a good argument to at least explain my point of view, even if I haven't convinced you on everything. If I did convince you and you're now wondering what to do next, you're exactly caught up with me. I feel like I've found solutions, but to be perfectly honest, I don't have any clue what to do about it. And after a year of trying to find common ground with the people who can change things, I feel really hopeless. I don't feel empowered to improve the web. There's already too many people at the table with their own agendas, and they have too much already invested to change their minds. So I'm leaving it up to everyone. If anything I've said today has stuck with you, if you have any idea how to change things, I encourage you to get involved in doing so, and I'm always open to talk. I wanna thank you all for coming today. Uh, let's have a great conference today. Let's be our very best to one another, and the words of uh, Anthony Oliveira, be brave enough to be kind. <laughs>